19, I'm going to jump ahead. 1973, this is an, a really important film for the Australian film industry in this period, uh, Alvin Purple. Well, I moved then from our transa <clears throat> because uh, Ron Purvis, who I, I had known, I worked for him at Natec, my second job in Bly Street in Sydney, had started Supreme Sound at Bly Street in Sydney in an old brick building, which he bought, he owned the building. Eventually he sold the building to put back into the film <laughs> part of the building and he, went, and he went broke there as well. But at this stage, he'd started this thing because he'd been contracted by um, a company that made a film called The Demonstrator. The Demonstrator was a film uh, shot, uh, directed by Warwick Freeman, who was the bandstand director, Channel 9. And when they went to mix it, they decided there was nowhere to mix it properly in Australia. So Ron organised to go to Hollywood. And they mixed it at Glen Glen in Hollywood, which was in the Paramount studio. The Glen Glen. when Lucille Ball was running the place. Correct, absolutely, <laughs> correct. Um, and because and, she was a big deal there, as you can she, imagine. She saved Paramount Studios. Yes, that's time, right. Yes. Yeah. Well, I went there a few times after that. But they went there and Ron saw Glen Glen. Now, Glen Glen was a, a sound facility. They shot the sound, they transferred the sound, the dubbing editors laid the sound, they mixed the sound. They actually, actually mixed the movies also for um, all the Paramount movies. I got very good friends with, I got to be very good friends with Dave Dockendorf, their chief mixer, who mixed Sundance Kid and good pictures like that. Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. Yes, yeah, right. he, he, he mixed the first reel of um, Chinatown till he insulted the French and then he wasn't on reel two because of Polanski. But anyway, oh. that's a different story. <laughs> <laughs> Dave actually said, I remember them. He said, they're the ones we kept we keep rescuing in the war. The next day he wasn't on the movie. <laughs> Can you believe that? That's, dead. That's a true story. I mean, he was a great black Dave, um, dead now, sadly. Um, so he, Ron Purvis saw Glenn Glenn. He said, I want one of them in, in Australia. He set up editing rooms on, on a floor. He'd already, already had the top floor used to record music, a lot of music, um, music scores even for film. He recorded the score for... Um, the Age of Consent in the top floor at United Sound, looking at a 35 mil image coming from a camera which was built on the roof of the building and had a porthole especially. <laughs> and they actually watched the movie as they, with a click track, and the old click tracks that would yeah. give, and the director's there, you know, tick, 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 dunk, and away to go, and that you could actually hear the dialogue. So he would know if the trumpet player's playing a bit loud there. He might have to rescore that. So he built a scoring stage. He did, yeah. an absolute, a genuine scoring stage. He was a real pioneer, Ron. Genuine score, And then he put editing rooms on the third floor, uh, on the fourth floor, and on the third floor, um, we, he put two studios, a mixing studio and a recording studio, which he so, called Studio um, L for looping, because that was the American term for ADR. Yep. And, and, and um, the big room was... We were studio, uh, I think we were D for dubbing, anyway. So this is the first full post-production facility in Australia? Made especially for features, absolutely correct. He bought, he bought the old optical dubbers that had been used on the robe in Hollywood. And with he, he and a mate that we used to call Sprockets, I forget his first name, his real name, that was his nickname, they changed all the optical uh, recording stuff to magnetic heads and a, a crazy man built these beautiful heads. Sprocket did all the other stuff, and Ron actually went broke converting these optical dubbers, which he got virtually for nothing, which were, they were, they were, they were um, essentially um, uh, cinema. They were, they were um, projectors, but they, were, they just, just sound, like sound heads off a projector. No, we mean just the sound heads. He virtually went broke doing that, but he built this studio, which, which did absolutely everything. It was fantastic. And the Australian Film Development Corporation opened soon after. And he, they lent him money. I don't know the whole financial thing, but they lent him money. And suddenly we, he was going to mix motion pictures in Sydney. So he rang me and said, I want you to come and work here. I sat there for the best part of a year while they, they got it all ready. And we started mixing movies, 1972, 73. Right. And that was the first 35 mil feature, was Alvin Purple. In 1973? Yeah. So at what level was the audio post technology then? How many tracks were you working with? We had, I think, 12 dubbers and a recorder. The recorder, <clears throat> which he also built himself, by the way, 
um, they built the, the uh, they didn't buy recorders overseas. He built this magnificent recorder, so good that EMI actually bought some of these. Um, we had 12 dubbers, but of those 12 dubbers, there were two or three which were three stripe, uh, had three stripe heads. So we could do a three stripe, we could put three, um, a three stripe premix if we wanted to, mm. onto, onto a, um, from say 12 tracks, get it at the end of three, and that would run off dubber, dubber one. And then of course we still had our three track recorder. So now you're getting to the period where multiple tracks, multiple multi-tracks going on, mm. Uh, on tape, so yeah. there's tape hits, and every time you well, bounce it, them, it, it you're is losing it quality. Is, but you mustn't say tape, you must say magnetic film. We right? are still working on magnetic film, <laughs> okay, sorry. But it's the same, it's yes. exactly the same, sure. Uh, but you're dealing with noise and yeah. this constant dubbing, you're losing high frequencies and sure. you're increasing noise. Sure. How did you cope with that? Well, to start with as a mixer, you, you cope with the, with the fact that there was no noise reduction by not opening any faders unless something was playing where you'll see, a, you'll see a mixing console now with 100 faders open. And they're, they're, all, they're all ready, and something's gonna come out of there eventually. It might be a doorknob, a door you know, bang. But you can leave them all open. In those days, you really knew, it was, as I said, when I said that the, those 30 second and 60 second ads I did were great practice, they were. Because I opened that and closed that. If there was no music there, I'd close it. If there was no dialogue on track four, I'd close it. I'd open that. So you might have had six dialogue track. In fact, we built a we built a console. We bought a console, made a console from a console that was that was designed by a mixer, which is something else in those days. Generally, they were designed by technicians. Uh -huh. So the thing you wanted most was up here. Yeah. The thing you wanted least was down here. This mixer was was Jimmy Stewart, not the actor Jimmy Stewart, but same name, which is how I remember him. So he did the he did a console like this, a three man console where the music mixer sat on the left, and he had six faders and a, and, a, and a couple of main gains because they used to have three track music mm -hmm. off 35 mil. So he, had, he could run two three track um, 35 mil um, music six tracks. tracks total. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and main gains on them. And I had about, I think there were eight dialogue uh, in the dialogue position, eight faders. Um, and, the, and the effects man had about eight faders and we would, we would mix three up, we call it, three at a time. Um, and so there might be 40 or 50 tracks in the film, but we could get them down to the fact, to the point where we had two or three effects, two or three premixes, mm. and the rest was essentially live. Yeah. And so we, we reduced premixing to an absolute minimum so that you could always change what was wanted. And the director was there at all the time, as opposed to later when it takes so long to mix a picture. Um, you'd have to get the director on. So this is the beauty of multi-track mixing coming in now. Yeah. Absolutely, it was fantastic. Speaking of directors, therefore, in the mix, this, so Alvin Purple, we're moving forward to a film called 27A, which I don't know much about. That was uh, the first film we ever mixed. That's just before Alvin, but it was on 16 mil. It was a feature. Starred Bob McDurrah. Do you know Bob McDurrah? McDurrah, no. an actor. Um, as a guy who'd signed himself into a an, into a um, institution, he's an alcoholic and then couldn't get out in Queensland. It was a true story. He, having signed himself in for treatment, he couldn't get out. And it was a, it was a, it was a, a very good film actually. And it was made by two young blokes called uh, Esmond Storm, who's oh, now passed know. away. Yep. Lovely lad, um, who'd come out here from Europe to Melbourne, and Hayden Keenan, who was a mate of his from Melbourne. And they were called uh, Smart Street Films. Smart Street Films still exists. In fact, Hayden Keenan made, through Hart Street, Smart Street Films, just recently, Persons of Interest for SBS. Oh, there you go. Yeah, yeah Hayden. So, so that was the first feature, 16 mil. Right, so um, this is the beginning of you working in features. Yeah. How much were the directors getting involved at that point in the post process and the sound oh, mix? Oh, very much, very much. In the mix, they were there every minute of every day. So, and, and they sort of had to be because um, even though you weren't running a lot of tracks compared to now, you're, you're running a minuscule amount of tracks, the decisions you were making were very important because if you did a three track premix, say, of the dialogues, so I could get, you know, $12 tracks down to eight. It's a commitment. You, you've, you've committed <laughs> something, haven't you? Yeah. So they would be, they'd say, yes, yeah, leave him out, I want him. Uh, yeah, I want, like, say you're in a crowd thing. He's important, this guy's important, his, his line's important, more important than this guy's line, and so on, so on. So 
but they were there all the time.